Good afternoon and welcome to the Liliana Sauter Lecture. This afternoon we're having Nancy Tom speaking on managing the modern infodemic, how the new social media are complicating old public health problems. Uh, before we get to the talk, I want to have a first a word about the Academy uh, and the library. So the New York Academy of Medicine is going to be celebrating its 175th anniversary next year, January of 2022. We are Champions for Health Equity, an organization devoted to improving the health of everyone through improving health equity. Uh, we tackle the barriers that prevent everyone from living a healthy life by generating knowledge, changing systems, engaging the public, ensuring health for all. The library has been around since the very beginning of the Academy, and we have been open to the public since 1878, the only medical library in the city so to do. We have one of the world's most significant collections in the history of medicine and public health, and we maintain active programs in digital collections, events, newsletters, and virtual visits. Sign up for us and visit us online, and now uh, in person as well by appointment. <clears throat> And now the talk. The annual Liliana Sauter Lecture was established in 2000, and it addresses the topic of medical ethics, broadly speaking. Liliana Sauter, MD, was a longtime fellow of the Academy, where she was active in the section on dermatology. She was a dedicated physician and a professor at Mount Sinai Medical School. In addition to her professional activities, Dr. Sauter had a keen interest in history and served as the liaison consultant to the Academy's 1993 program, Paracelsus Renaissance Physician. And this year, the Liliana Sauter Lecture is being delivered by Nancy Toms. And the topic again, managing the modern infodemic, how the new social media are complicating old public health problems. This talk will provide historical perspective on the role of the new digital media in spreading false and misleading information about COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Thomas calls this the infodemic, that it's an information epidemic, and it's often assumed to be a post-internet problem. But the challenges that misinformation and disinformation have posed to American public health have a much longer history. The presentation will contextualize today's infodemic within the intertwined histories of epidemics, public health preparedness, mass media, risk communication, and information revolutions in hopes of better understanding the distrust of information that poses such a challenge to public health efforts today. Nancy Thomas is the SUNY Distinguished Professor in the Department of History at Stony Brook University. She is the author of four books, A Generous Confidence, Thomas Story Kirkbride and the Art of Asylum Keeping, Madness in America, Cultural and Medical Perceptions of Mental Illness Before 1914, The Gospel of Germs, Men, Women, and the Microbe in American Life, uh, published in 1998 as winner of both the American Association for the History of Medicine's Welch Medal and the History of Science Society's Davis Prize. And actually, a, uh, I speak from experience, a marvelous book to teach with. Um, and Remaking the American Patient, How Madison Avenue and Modern Medicine Turned Patients into Consumers, uh, published in 2016 and winner of the 2017 Bancroft Prize. In 2011, she received the American Public Health Association's Arthur Wieseltier Award for, his, for her distinguished body of scholarship in the history of public health. And she's currently working on a new research project about the historical origins of the modern infodemic. And we'll hear more about that tonight. Uh, there will be time for questions after Dr. Tom's presentation. Please pose them in the chat and I'll pass them on to her. So uh, now I turn it over to Nancy. Thank you. Hello on this lovely day in uh, New York. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm always happy to visit the New York Academy of Medicine and see my friends and colleagues, even if only virtually. Uh, I want to give my thanks to Dr. Souter's foresightedness in uh, endowing this le lecture and express my honor in being asked to give it this year. And I look forward to um, the help you can give me with this new 
project. Um, so I am going at this point to uh, share my, uh, hopefully, and where is it? Can you all see it now? Hello? Oh dear. I can hear nothing. <laughs> Whoops. Hello? Nancy, we can see your background, but we can't see the presentation itself. Okay, um, so let me see if I, uh, I also just can't hear you. Uh, let me try this again. Um, no, okay. Can you see it now? No, that's the same. I, I have no idea what the problem is. Uh, Reggie, can I ask you to pull yours up? Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, good. So I think you would agree with me that one of the most distressing aspects, uh, could I have the next uh, slide? Thank you. Uh, one of the most distressing aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the damage done by the easy circulation of false and misleading information. We are facing what one uh, psychologist has called a pandemic of poppycock. Um, and it has been deeply disheartening. When I talk to colleagues in academic medicine and the sciences and public health, they're all bewildered by the pushback against measures designed to halt the spread of this deadly uh, new virus. How can it be, they ask, in the midst of such evidence-based um, um, evidence, uh, recommendations, not to mention the wonders of the mRNA vaccine, that so many citizens and voters in the supposedly developed world uh, apparently believe the most jaw-dropping nonsense. Um, in the United States, for example, the current fad of people refusing to take the COVID vaccination, uh, but clamoring instead to take ivermectin, a drug uh, used to treat horse parasites. I too am very disheartened by all this, but I am not surprised. For decades, expert voices within public health, within the social sciences, within the fields of ethics, have tried to call out the problems, not only with scientific risk communication, but also trust in science itself. And those voices have largely been ignored in terms of pandemic planning. I hope more attention is paid um, in future, and my work is one little bit in that direction. So where has this pandemic of poppy cop come from? The easiest explanation is the one you are likely to hear most often. It's all social media's fault. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most serious global public health crisis to have occurred since the spread of personal digital devices to now used by roughly 59% of the world population. And public leader, uh, health leaders often link um, their inability to slow COVID's spread to this heightened degree of unfiltered connectivity, which has enabled the rapid sharing of false and misleading information. I'm here today to suggest that that story is overly simplistic. I do completely agree that social media has been a game changer in terms of this pandemic but that game was already well underway before the invention of Facebook. Misinformation, epidemics, and media revolutions have historically gone hand in hand. 
we have to go beyond simplistic habits of blaming a particular form of media or even scientific illiteracy uh, and take a, a good long hard look at the way we do science, communicate about science and play politics with science. Now I offer this critical perspective to you with some trepidation because rarely do historians get called out in the middle of a uh, uh, health crisis to give advice. But in fact, that opportunity has been opened up to me. If I could have the next slide. Uh, last spring, someone from the WHO's uh, European Union division heard me give a very early version of this talk and invited me to write a scoping review on the history of the concept of the infodemic. And so for the last six months, I have been working with Manon Perry from the University of Amsterdam on this health evidence network report. That work has given me the privilege of talking to the WHO staffers who are writing guidance for their member nations about how to combat COVID misinformation. And uh, I have learned a world uh, from them. And tonight I'm gonna to be sharing some of what I've learned from them and what I hope I've been able to uh, help them with. Among English speakers, the word infodemic, which is a word blend of information plus epidemic, has become widely used in the past year and a half to describe the torrent of confusing, misleading, and sometimes downright crazy information about uh, COVID uh, circulating on um, social media. As Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the, w, uh, of the World Health Organization, noted in uh, mid-February 2020, quote, we are not fighting just an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic in the form of fake news that spreads faster and more easily than this virus. The WHO now defines an infodemic as, quote, an overabundance of information some accurate and some not occurring during uh, uh, an epidemic. Some that is accurate and some that is not occurring uh, during an epidemic. There is so much information that the higher quality parts become hard to access or they get contradicted by the uh, really bad stuff. Since 2020, the study of infodemics, which is called infodemiology, has become a booming academic industry producing its own avalanche of data and specialists. And here I show you the cover of the WHO's public health research agenda for managing infodemics. Um, and I, I like the image of us all, you know, as the fabled people with one hand on one part of the elephant. I'm down at the, my group is down there at the very bottom, the social and behavioral uh, sciences trying to, uh, do our bit. The term infodemiology was coined in 2002 by the physician uh, information uh, technology specialist Gunther Eisenbeck. The term infodemics was coined in 2003 by the political scientist David Rothkopf, who was writing about the SARS pandemic. From its first use, the term infodemic has connected the growing threat of emerging infectious diseases with the growth of the information highway. And that makes it a great concept to think historically and comparatively about the two types of virality. First, the microbiological kind, that is the ability of novel viruses to spread quickly around an interconnected world. And second, the impact of an increasingly complex network of personal electronic devices, including laptops, cell phones, um, that allow billions of people to access and interact with resources available on the World Wide Web, also known as the internet. Historians, including me, realize that this doubly networked world uh, is a significant historical phenomenon. But we are hardwired, sorry for the pun, um, to resist overly simplistic techno-deterministic explanations of media impact. Historians are well aware that the word blend infodemic may have been new in 2003, but the underlying concept that uncertain and misleading information 
can make epidemics work was definitely not. Every epidemic of the past has produced improbable facts, confusing rumors, and conspiracy theories. Check out Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year about the 1665 outbreak of the bubonic plague in London, and you will find fake news and crazy cures aplenty. Those of us over the age of 50 do not need to go that far back. We lived through the early years of the global HIV AIDS pandemic, which also produced an avalanche of misinformation uh, and cruel discrimination based on that misinformation, on bogus cures and also conspiracy theories about the origin of HIV. In a 1998 article, about the AIDS pandemic, journalist Ellen Goodman reached conclusions strikingly similar to Rothkopf's 2003 piece on SARS when she wrote, misinformation is highly infectious. We can agree then that while the digital revolution may have magnified the problems of communicating during a pandemic, it certainly did not create them. So how then do we make sense of this change over time? That's what I want to think uh, with you uh, about today. I'm going first to introduce you to some of the terminology being used in this current discussion. And then I'm going to do a very brief comparative review of the mis misinformation problem uh, during the early HIV AIDS pandemic and then COVID. So essentially the before and after of, of, the, uh, of the internet. Um, note I've also done this comparison with the World War I influenza pandemic, um, but the AIDS is, I, I think, a better tool for my, uh, for my purpose, at, at least in this talk today. So let me start by explaining some of the terms I'm using, which I've drawn from uh, the recent work on, uh, first on fake news, uh, a lot of this, uh, has developed since 2016, and now is being applied to uh, COVID misinformation. Um, if I could have the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is from Claire Wardle's very uh, uh, helpful uh, overview called A New World Disorder, Scientific American in 2019, where she gives uh, kind of nice uh, infogram uh, misinformation is uh, considered unintended or natural in the confusion that it brings. It could be a simple mistake, or it could be a revision of facts after receiving new information, which in fact is, is a common problem, especially with a, a new uh, uh, viral agent. Disinformation is a more intentional effort to sow falsehoods for personal or financial gain. And depending on how much harm you do with your disinformation, uh, it can be considered malicious, hence malinformation as the, the, the worst form uh, of, of uh, bad information in this model. Can I see the next? Uh, here's another graphic from uh, M.M. Waldroff. Uh, Again, drawn from uh, uh, the conception of fake news, but also very useful in thinking about COVID uh, misinformation. Now, you're, uh, some of you will be immediately thinking, who decides which, which is which? Misinformation, disinformation. Aha, that is indeed uh, a problem. Uh, but let's start with the terms and, and how uh, they, they are um, being uh, applied. I've noticed in my reading um, that, that in the, the, how the preoccupation with information, misinformation, and di disinformation, in fact, can deflect our attention from the processes of how information is gathered, how things are measured, and how it's analyzed. In other words, exactly the kind of complex stuff that uh, historians and um, science studies uh, uh, researchers um, study. In my own past efforts to understand what uh, has been called the health information revolution that started in the 1970s, I often noted the tendency to equate a data dump with the securing of informed consent. 
And the advent of big data, machine learning, algorithms, and modeling has, uh, has really made it all the more important to think about the upfront, what, what is the data getting processed um, in these ways and, and presented. In fairness, scholars engaged in the study of digital communication are aware of the complexities that information doesn't equal understanding. If I could see the next uh, graphic, you often see this, uh, this graphic model dates back to the 1970s um, and the beginnings of the, the uh, computer revolution, attempting to differentiate uh, among data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Um, so how you interpret the data uh, becomes your information, the, what insights do you, you derive by the analysis information, there's your knowledge and wisdom. I'm still not quite entirely sure what that is, but, but it's some higher, um, higher truth that uh, we, we uh, arrive at. Um, the final term that I want to introduce uh, for our discussion um, is in the next slide, and that's um, denialism. This is also a term that uh, you often see in discussions of COVID misinformation. Um, a lot of the thinking about science denialism um, has evolved over some years now, um, with scholars pointing out the similarities and techniques used by various parties who want to uh, deny that something happened. Uh, it could be the Holocaust, it could be the dangers of using tobacco products, it could be the role of HIV in causing AIDS, and last but not least, climate change. This is a, ni a nice graphic developed by a climate activist named John Cook that lays out the different um, uh, forms of denialism, fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking and conspiracy theories. What many of these models assumes is that when we are faced with a new public health threat, it is normal to have an initial period of confusion and even denialism. But once the scientific consensus settles in, long-term refusal, refusal to accept the facts can become maladaptive and ultimately malignant. These are some of the terms um, that, that they use. And how you measure the harm done by this, this, um, this bad information um, is often done by trying to make uh, guesstimates of the numbers of lives that might have been saved had a deliberate disinformation campaign not taken place. And we're also seeing those kinds of guesstimates being made for uh, COVID today. As you probably see by now, using these terms, it's, it's very helpful to think with them, but they, um, they involve a lot of, of assumptions. Um, and I look forward to a lively uh, discussion about them. Um, I, I use them, but with some trepidation. I, I realize their, uh, their imperfections for, uh, for sure. But I, I, I want to try to, to take them as a, a set of uh, tools to do my compare and contrast um, of the uh, early HIV AIDS and COVID in the United States. To my way of thinking, the AIDS pandemic is a good point of comparison in many ways. It is now portrayed as the first of the new emerging uh, infectious diseases of the late 20th century. It's deadly spread across the globe inspired new interest in public health preparedness planning at both the national and international level, not to mention global health. It also inspired a torrent of misinformation disinformation and denialism that went viral before there was the internet. So let me give a very brief and, and overly simplistic summary just of the American uh, experience of the pandemic. As you probably uh, know, the Centers for Disease Control received the first reports of this possibly deadly new disease in 1981. Virologists quickly worked to isolate the cause, which was identified in 1984 as a retrovirus by the standards of the time, very quick. Um, and with the development of the ELISA test, um, uh, researchers could clarify 
the virus's mechanisms of spread through the exchange of semen and blood during sex, IV drug use, and blood transfusions. In retrospect, the speed with which this consensus emerged is impressive. Yet the AIDS pandemic inspired a robust cycle of misinformation and disinformation. Some of the misinformation had to do with the normal churn of scientific discovery. As new information became available, experts revised their previous views. For example, uh, GRID, gay-related immune deficiency, became AIDS. Uh, stigma and bias certainly formed major obs obstacles to rolling out information about cause and prevention, which also uh, created a lot of uncertainty. Those groups perceived most at risk from AIDS did not often trust the public health authorities. Newly liberated gay men were not eager to get stuffed back into the closet in the early 1980s. Black communities concerned about IV drug abuse were resistant to ideas of needle exchange and um, other harm reduction measures. And those least at risk from AIDS refused to believe they in fact were relatively safe. Many felt a terror of casual contact that caused rampant discrimination and even shunning. And this problem was one inspiration for my writing the book, The Gospel of Germs. If you can see the next, uh, um, this is an illustration from, um, from that book of a New York State Department of Health poster in 1987. None of these will give you AIDS. All, the, all those four things were uh, aspects of the old gospel of germs uh, of how um, diseases spread through casual contact or uh, object uh, tra transmission. So a lot of, of AIDS education was undoing uh, the old gospel of germs. The mistrust of public health expertise greatly complicated that work of health education, and it probably resulted in higher death tolls than had to be. But it certainly led to a landmark recognition in public health about the importance of trust and how you cultivate trust. If the sound information you present is not delivered by a person that that community trusts, it is likely not to be accepted. Once the message about AIDS, uh, the risks came from people trusted by those groups most at risk, it was possible to slow transmission. It made a huge difference. Um, that tactic was uh, effectively used by gay activists. If you can see the next uh, um, slide, these are just some of the uh, outreach aids developed by um, the uh, San Francisco gay community uh, about HIV um, education. Um, and there was a comparable outreach from um, uh, Black community leaders and advocates working in uh, Black neighborhoods. Um, and the next slide shows you uh, some of the uh, material, one of the material uh, reports developed by the Philadelphia-based group, Babashi. So indeed, one of the prime lessons that public health educators learned with HIV AIDS um, has now become a bedrock assumption about um, how to do public health education during the crisis, um, that you need to get it into the, the hands of, of um, local trusted leaders. And note that the most successful forms of AIDS outreach did not involve fancy forms of media. They were used a lot of old school, low cost methods, including posters, uh, pamphlets. I mean, this looks like it was probably uh, run off on the equivalent of a mimeograph machine um, and people in the form of uh, community uh, advocates and workers who, who spoke one-on-one. -on -one. Now you may be asking at this point, where was the traditional media in all of this? In fact, the AIDS pandemic occurred at a time period of significant media upheaval in the United States. As cable television was challenging the old broadcast system and a 24 news cycle uh, was just beginning. 
Cable Network News uh, was founded in 1980. And programming and marketing to so-called mass audiences, which is what people of my generation grew up when there were only three, three uh, uh, networks broadcasting content, um, that began to break up and uh, media uh, companies look to cultivate more diversity um, in media markets as a way to, to build up their market share. You might think that this would translate into swift and extensive coverage of HIV AIDS, but in fact, you would be wrong. <laughs> that was not the case. For in the 1980s was also an era of growing political conservatism. Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980 and again in 1984 with the help of the so-called moral majority. The emerging scientific consensus about AIDS um, and, and how it spread actually encouraged alliances uh, between um, old line, often Roman Catholic um, political conservatives and newer uh, white evangelicals um, around the belief that uh, AIDS was God's punishment on uh, gays and drug users. The conservative talk show host, Rush Limbaugh, used AIDS to start his career as a media talking head. Um, as you probably know, Ronald Reagan did not use his powers as president to um, counter that or to mobilize action against AIDS. He did not even say the word until 1985, and he did not give a speech about AIDS until 1987. Only slowly did the mainstream print and electronic journalism start to break their silence. And that coverage remained very one-sided in its focus on the so-called gay plague and showed far less interest in AIDS as a problem in black and brown neighborhoods. It is true that their less moralistic coverage about AIDS started to reinforce a growing sense of division between conservative and liberal uh, media outlets, a division that um, has only intensified in, in recent years. Um, but if you look at the media history of HIV AIDS, you do not come across with um, a very, um, uh, a very um, uh, upbeat story about how the media handled uh, a, a major pandemic of this sort. There were in fact many conspiracy theories about HIV AIDS, that the virus had been invented by the CIA, that it was part of a deliberate genocide against black people and so forth. It also gave rise to organized denialism, the most famous exponent of which was the University of California at Berkeley molecular biologist, Peter Duesberg, who insisted and still does that there was no proof that HIV caused AIDS. Uh, Duesberg became the leader of a diverse group of activists who, who uh, distrusted the pharmaceutical industry, uh, commercial parties who wanted to promote natural alternatives to drugs like AZT, and last but not least, journalists looking for a story. And those views got an international hearing in South Africa during the presidency, presidency of Thabo Mbeki. Again, note that AIDS denialism established its profile using now old fashioned techniques. People wrote articles and books, they gave speeches, they had in-person meetings with each other and they cultivated media activity uh, of their activities. Um, once the internet developed, they did start to um, use it, uh, uh, but not really until the early uh, 2000s. So this whole dis disinformation movement, again, uh, was, uh, did not require social media for its, uh, for its spread. So this brings us to the question, how did the arrival of new information technologies change these older dynamics of misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy thinking and denialism. And this is a research question that many of us are tackling right now. And so I can only give you some uh, preliminary insights. Um, certainly one major factor uh, was the transition between a static web 1.0 to a more interactive web 2.0. With the, the, the first web, people clicked on websites but could not contribute to its content. 
it was a largely passive experience. With Web 2.0, the user could become a content creator. And with social networking sites, this really took off. Facebook began in 2004 um, and, and uh, video sharing sites, for example, YouTube, which began in 2005. Then with the arrival of smartphones, handheld devices became portals to all these interactive um, activities as, as well as many others. And just so you can kind of place the timeline, the app store for Apple smartphones opened in 2007. So we see in that first decade of uh, the 21st century, uh, the opening up of these more interactive uh, methods of communication. The founders of the World Wide Net, the Web envisioned it as an objective tool to promote rational discourse and data sharing in the name of human progress. But this more inter interactive network of connections created space for that, but also for the opposite, the use of social media to propagate alternative truths and cultivate informational bubbles that would be hard to penetrate. That potential to complicate public health responses to emerging disease outbreaks started to become evident with SARS, increased with Ebola and, and uh, subsequently Zika. So that uh, well before um, um, the COVID uh, pandemic, there was a lot of discussion going on in public health circles about how to deal with these problems. As I mentioned, uh, so in, in effect, COVID has really just brought into focus a set of problems that people were already quite worried about uh, before it came along. As I mentioned earlier, COVID is the biggest pandemic to occur since that second stage of the more interactive web, which uh, allows now an estimated 4.7 billion people uh, to access the internet. And so far, that enhanced connectivity has seemed more a liability than a benefit. As Joan Donovan, the director of the Kennedy School's uh, Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy has noted, uh, the internet, these are her words, has, hasn't been built for a pandemic. It hasn't been built for giving timely, relevant, local, and redundant information, which is what everybody needs in this moment. The ease of producing and distributing messages has allowed the wide circulation of dubious information about risky treatments and conspiracy theories. Uh, the worst of which is uh, moving through private circuits that even media experts like Donovan cannot track the dark web. As she writes, it's like crazy on crazy. These developments have understandably triggered uh, that tidal wave of research into digital media and the digital harms they can do. And we need that work for sure. But we also need to put that media in a larger perspective and to see how in fact they digital media have simply worsened climates of mistrust and already politicized health issues that already existed. If we focus only on managing the AI world, the social media, we miss the deeper infrastructure and the links among national security planning, inequality, political partisanship, and even healthcare choice um, that has so complicated public health messaging uh, and complicated it even before COVID arrived. Let me be clear, I am not disputing the importance of social media and the terrific work that's being done on its role in creating and sustaining fake news about COVID. I've learned a lot from it. For example, the seminal work that came out of MIT in 2018 that shows false news travels faster than accurate news uh, precisely because it's so wacky. Um, it's easier to get poppycock out there uh, with the kind of business models that dominate in today's social media dominated world. Um, the lower barriers of access, the absence of filters, um, and then the, um, the, the, what you can get people to click on is how you uh, get advertisers, for example, to, um, to pay for your, your site. These are extremely important uh, developments that we need to take very seriously. My point, I hope, is more nuanced 
that we have to be more critical about the assumptions we are making in fighting these digital harms. It is not just digital messages and digital harms that require our attention. Assuming that interactive social media is the only cause of resistance obscures the reality. Most people do not get their information exclusively from their personal devices. And this is especially true of older adults and also people of color. Um, and also people who do not have easy access to uh, the internet. They're on the other side of the digital divide. Studies that are being done as we speak suggest that people are taking in a complex range of information that includes the old media, TV and radio, and word of mouth. And it is, uh, uh, those are channels not being mediated by Facebook. The water cooler conversation you have with a colleague or the chat with your family doctor are still part of um, the way information about COVID is, is getting out there. In fact, if you go beyond the clickbait stories about the latest bizarre posting by a self-appointed COVID denier, you might even find some good news out there. There are preliminary studies that suggest many people have not gotten lost in the social media funhouse. Rates of fact-checking are way up. It may take people a while, um, but those who were confused and uncertain in the beginning have slowly found their way to more reliable sources of information. And they have been aided in that by actual people talking to them, people they trust, going door to door, that personal touch is, has made um, a difference. I'm gonna go out a limb here and say the majority of uh, Americans responding to COVID are not deliberately pushing out what they know to be misinformation. So in some ways, the system of information sharing that we've uh, set up has not been a total disaster. This is the class half full um, argument. It is the minority of COVID deniers and resistors who have led the public resistance and partisan political efforts to hamstring uh, social distancing and vaccination as ways to manage the spread of uh, COVID-19. Now it's oversimplistic to see again that resistance as just a social media problem. In fact, the dynamic interchanges between old and new media are a key to the social media's power. Fox News and the New York Post are prime spreaders of COVID misinformation, and they are not new media forms. So I'm saying too exclusive a focus on digital media and digital harms misses that vital connection and the complexity. It is this determined minority that gets the media attention, creating an infodemic about the infodemic, as one commentator recently put it. Don't get me wrong. I think we need to be studying um, the, these uh, outliers very much and trying to figure out how, how to, uh, to um, uh, divert the harms that they are doing. Um, but investing um, heavily in, um, in making those COVID deniers more scientific, li scientifically literate is in my view, a waste of time. They are not going to stop no matter what the New York Academy of Medicine says. Um, and in fact, uh, as much as I am a believer in free speech, I think the more heavy handed approach um, of taking down the easy access of people spreading um, really, really malinformation uh, is warranted. It's difficult, it's a hard decision, but it, it needs to be done. So what are my takeaway points for you today? What, what I, I'm suggesting is that we need to broaden our problem solving beyond a too exclusive focus on digital media and the digital harms they create. We need to invest more in person-to-person -person public health outreach methods to community influencers and not just rely on passive surveillance of what is on Facebook or even trying to get stuff taken down on Facebook. 
we need to shift uh, or we need to invest not simply in monitoring information that may do digital harms to improving the infrastructure of protection against the harms that are created. The small minority of people um, opposed to COVID vaccination is wreaking havoc in the US uh, not only via digital outreach, but in person by showing up at school board meetings and at healthcare uh, facilities. And again, this audience, I don't tell you, need to tell you about the kinds of tensions and, and uh, 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 even direct assaults the healthcare workers uh, uh, have, have come, uh, come under uh, in, in the past year and a half. Workers in big box stores and restaurants are being assaulted by angry COVID deniers. We need to think more about how to protect those people in real time. I'd like to see as much investment in strategies to protect frontline workers against physical assault and emotional abuse as uh, devising new algorithms to uh, track uh, misinformation. Um, and I've kind of, uh, let me just show you some of the slides that um, I, um, that contribute to my thinking about this. I got distracted and forgot to show them. But could we see, um, I just have a, uh, some slides here just uh, showing, uh, uh, this is from a, a Queensboro, um, uh, playground, but keep going. Um, just some of the, uh, the, the activism that has led, if we can see to the next one, to confrontations um, in school boards, for example, uh, parents who don't want to see any masking, if we can see the next slide, um, and also uh, conflicts with, with healthcare workers. This is from uh, last spring, but again, this phenomena is still very much uh, with us. Um, this is, I guess, a digital, a result of a digital harm, but it's a lot more than that. I think you would, uh, you would agree uh, with me. Um, I'd like to see uh, as much investment in building bridges of trust with community leaders and community organizations before uh, another crisis like this one uh, emerges. One of my favorite lines in one of the WHO documents that I was given to read was, um, uh, uh, one of their uh, um, experts said, a disaster is not time to be handing out business cards um, and that we need to know who our potential partners are and make connections with them before a crisis occurs. That is exactly what public health is all about. But ask yourself, is, th is that where the money has gone over the last 20 years? I think you'll say no. The lessons of the early AIDS pandemic are certainly worth revisiting here. It was that combination of educational outreach and community network that got the job done. And old, for, old fashioned forms of outreach, people going door to door to convince those hesitant to get the COVID vaccine, uh, as well as plain old coercion, the boss saying, I'm fired if I don't get vaccinated, work better than simply another pu public service message by itself or by policing what is on Facebook. It's the combination that matters. And we cannot let the newness of the latest social media strategy or the lunacy of the latest post on Twitter to make us uh, lose sight of that. Let, let me end with a plea to my scientist colleagues um, that as we think about the new normal, uh, think twice before you say that the uh, cure for the pandemic of poppycock is more research in basic science. I think we need more than that. We need more investment in the human sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities that help pinpoint how communication about science can be done in a forum that people can understand and trust. We need more investment in health infrastructure that makes it possible for people to follow scientific advice. And we have to anticipate trust issues um, that we face that may seem uh, nonsensical. I often hear scientists say, but we are objective. How can people think that we're not perfectly objective, that we have political um, incentives? The fact is that um, it doesn't take a lot of uh, scientific literacy to find out the amount of um, basic research that is funded either by the central government, known to uh, some as the deep state, 
or the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and that is part of the reason some people are, are uh, hesitant to trust what, what they hear. And despite the efforts of, of uh, institutions like the New York Academy of Medicine to develop high standards and to shield scientific research from political and corporate influence, we know it still persists. And the anti-vax movement in particular has uh, thrived on exposés of past scientific misconduct and corporate malfeasance. So this is where we need to pull together that in addition to asking for more funding for basic research, also support research into how those fundings are understood and received, and not just studies that rely on an algorithm to take the public pulse. Thank you. And we can just skip the last uh, couple of slides there. Nancy, thank you so much. That was a great talk. Uh, we have some time for questions and there are some appearing in the chat. So let me, let me pose a few of them for you. Um, one of them is, I wonder if Professor Toms could discuss whether she sees a difference between anti-vaccine people and anti-maskers. It seems that the two are not totally the same, although of course there is overlap. Yes, I, I agree. They're really, um, that has been one of the scarier at, uh, facets of COVID is the way that it brought um, one kind of, of group that I'll say is more on the anti-mask, don't ask me to do anything to protect the community. It's, it's uh, with the anti-vaxxers who, um, they're much more diverse. They're all different kinds of reasons for uh, being hesitant or, or uh, resistant to um, vaccination. So I completely agree with you that we need to separate uh, and be careful. Um, another thing is that um, one of the questions is, should departments of health buy ads on platforms to get the information out to the public? And I think I know what your answer is going to be, but I would welcome you to say it. <laughs> well, I don't think that's a bad idea, but in terms of prioritizing, um, I mean, I've been pretty impressed at, at the kind of public service ads that have gotten out that are shown on, on my television station. Um, so more of that, but um, public health departments have so little money. Um, I'd like to see that burden put on, on somebody else. That's probably a pipe dream. Um, but um, I, I guess I'd like to see a more coordinated uh, effort uh, that, um, you know, there, there'd be a big picture um, approach to this. Um, and not just rely on, on the poor New York City Department of Public Health. Okay. Uh, one person says that with HIV AIDS, we see that min misinformation can have lasting impact decades later. And I think that's one of the things about many of these different uh, pandemics and the, and the, and the uh, myths that they spawn. Um, we see it in current policy where most are not still allowed to donate blood products regardless of their HIV status. Uh, it's a broad question. What can be done to make changes on a policy level other than getting new elected officials? I, I think because COVID has been such a wake up call that maybe there will be more of those discussions in policy circles. Um, as I have to say over, uh, you know, having looked in, in while I was uh, in lockdown, gone back and looked at pandemic planning, um, the policy tends to really invest in hardware um, mm -hmm. and not in software. And I think of what we do basically as, as software. Um, and I hear this at my own university, the real excitement is, well, what new initiatives are coming from the NSF to go create more AI programs? There's no initiative coming out of the NSF to um, heal a broken public health system. So um, I think that um, in terms of making our voices heard as a community is just to keep pounding away. Um, on on um, on those needs uh, whenever we can. 
Good, good, thank you. I'm gonna have two more questions. Um, the first is how can public health people practically divorce public anger about a host of issues from the public health issues themselves? It yeah. seems that without dialing down the anger, we can't achieve much in the way of achieving goals. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I, I don't, I, I, I really respect those of you in the front lines who are having to calmly um, speak to um, the members of the public that are, are coming at you. I am trying to learn more uh, from psychology. Uh, I mean, not all of the psychology of, of uh, uh, debunking is, I think, completely, I think it's problematic, but in some ways, uh, psychology has been working on this debunking problem um, with uh, social psychology, particularly, that I think maybe uh, those of us in the public health field, if we can kind of connect with that work and borrow uh, some of their tools that that could really, that could really help. Um, I'd also like to see us just find a place where we could talk about these issues as professionals. And I've heard this every time I give this talk, it's like people say, where can we talk more about this? And I'm not really sure what, what's the right organization. It crosses um, so many lines, but I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear in the chat, send me an email uh, if you have thoughts about that. And, and actually that leads into the last question we have time for tonight. How do you recommend introducing this topic to medical trainees and medical students? Yes, um, early and often. Um, <laughs> and um, if anything I've learned by reading all this disinformation literature um, and, and the debunking is that if you may think you want to deny it completely. But in fact, you can often convince people to come around if you acknowledge they might have a reason for their concerns. So with uh, a medical, um, uh, you know, someone to say, uh, not to hit the basic science is totally objective line, but to say, well, I could see why you might have concerns about um, how the vaccine ha has been developed, but let me try to talk about some of those concerns. So you don't shut them down, you try to invite them in. Easier said than done. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for, yes. for questions and comments, uh, but let's all thank say you. thank you. And then I wanna give a little bit of a shout out to some upcoming events that are happening at the Academy over the next couple of weeks. So um, in, in two days time, actually, the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation will be honoring Dr. Jennifer Dudna, who um, received the Nobel Prize in 2020 for her work on CRISPR. And that will take place uh, Thursday, October 28th, uh, from four to five in the afternoon. And second, our own awards ceremony will, is taking place in uh, two weeks time on November 9th, again, from four to five in the afternoon. The honorees are listed on the, um, on the um, uh, slide here. We'll also have special remarks from Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And it should be a very interesting uh, hour presentation then. Um, there's some information about this in the chat also in terms of registering for both of these events. And with that, I wanna thank Nancy again for her fine presentation and for everyone's great comments. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye.